I do believe that within my group, we start first with the ethical and moral implication, and we've been designing toward human dignity, rather than design just to do it for the sake of technology. Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. Super pumped to be talking about the future of the brain. We have Dr. Newton Howard joining us on the show. Hello. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm super excited for this. It was great being there yesterday for the talk that you were giving. And it was very cool learning more about your work and I'm excited to be able to share it with our audience. For those that don't know, Dr. Newton Howard is a brain and cognitive scientist, the former director of the MIT Mind Machine Project. He is a professor of computational neuroscience and functional neurosurgery at the University of Oxford, where he directs the Oxford Computational Neuroscience Laboratory. He is also the director of MIT Synthetic Intelligence Lab, the founder of the Center for Advanced Defense Studies, and the chairman of the Brain Sciences Foundation. You can find all of Newton's links below, including his website, newtonhoward.com, ni2o.com, as well as his LinkedIn profile. Newton, let's start things off with one of our favorite questions to ask our guests. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? We live in an interesting time uh, where basically we have to re-examine where we're putting our resources and the allocation of these resources will then guide and govern uh, what is the next chapter of our history of our existence. Um, may or may not totally agree with all the way of how we allocating this at this time. Uh, to the extent possible, I believe that uh, more allocation should be toward things that prevent um, our Clyde was um, our an evident <laughs> an eventual and non-avoidable fate of this planet becoming obsolete. Um, a lot more science ought to be directed in that uh, uh, focus and uh, less toward trying to uh, create more conflicts uh, in the name of eradicating conflicts. Okay, I was going to ask you about where to optimally allocate the resources that you wanted to, how you wanted to see our trajectory move in that direction, but you gave the example of us being, having more sustainable mentality about our own planet. Is that kind of the essence? Yes. Okay. Yes. The, the direction that we're going right now um, assumes the existence of these resources forever taken for granted everything that we have on the surface of this planet and uh, uh, inevitably ignore the fact that we might have to have a replacement in the not too distant future. A uh, few hundred thousand years or uh, is not a long time in human existence. So it has to be starting uh, planning for it now and accounted for it now not just uh, when a crisis erupt. It's unacceptable that meteorites would be on a course of collision to Earth and nobody noticed it and escaped somebody's radar <laughs> in this time that we live in. Um, it points to a, f a fallacy or something wrong in the way we're directing our resources. Mm. Mm. And then what would be some of the more optimal resource allocation methodologies that we could pursue at the private level, at the governmental level, at which levels and how would we allocate the resources to these efforts? I mean, I'm naturally biased to things that uh, enhances us as human, uh, that gives us the faculty that we lost and uh, make, a, make us better um, at what we uh, were uh, on existence for and seeing that that this augmentation uh, would also come out at a price of science and an allocation of uh, which direction do I put things into the uh, brain research, do I put things into space research 
they put things into you know uh, static AI or synthetic AI. Mm. Uh, uh, what's, most optimal you know, what's most optimal for increasing the intelligence of us towards that okay. sustainability? Yes. Okay, interesting. So it might not even be just financially figuring out where to funnel money, but it's where can we also galvanize our our own intellect and time and these right. types of things. Right, and not you know financial allocation isn't necessarily uh, just the the uh, the predicament that we're solving for, um, but the uh, intrinsic drive mm. um, that would govern mm -hmm. these financial allocations and other allocation. Our resources, our time, our focus, uh, our surrounding uh, that influences our epigenetic, epigenetics and so forth. Mm -hmm. And then where do you think that all of the indigenous cultures that are currently making it clear to humans that are living in metropolises about this disconnection that we have from source this disconnection that we have from nature, from what sustains us, where do you think that fits into all of the issues that we have in our society today? Um, there's a good effort uh, from a lot of, uh, lots of communities and people and individuals and or organizations to make back this uh, connection uh, that is uh, lost but not fully detached. Uh, through awareness, uh, through realizing um, what is it that we are missing, what has gone wrong, um, where did we depart, and then make that turn back into these points and correct them so that we can actually have a better uh, utilization of our resources, including the human energy and the human capital. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yes. One of the most common ones for us is that literally just connect more. We have this, this beautiful ambiance around us right now recording this interview outdoors. And the breaths of air and the drinks of water and the bites of food, all these things are reminders for us that, that this planet sustains us and that we need to treat it like it sustains us and that to remember that when children grow up in metropolis is that they don't necessarily get to con connect to the cosmos because they can't see them but due to the light pollution they go to the grocery store exchange a sheet of paper for an apple they don't know how the apple got there so these are critical processes in remembering what sustains us and this ties that to the sustainability that you're mentioning indeed indeed now newton it's probably one of the most important things that we do in the future is to make sure that we understand what's actually happening inside of our brains, inside of our bodies at large, including our hearts and all of our major organs, but especially our brain is f so important. And actually, it's probably one of the most beautiful parts of the evolutionary trajectory is this nervous system that's able to take in these inputs, make sense of these inputs, and then make decisions in the environment that it's in. Teach us about kind of like that evolutionary trajectory of the brain, what got you hooked into being fascinated with it, and then what you're up to now. So interesting that you uh, uh, put it that way, because when I think about the investigation of where is the mind, uh, it brings me to the thought that uh, Herophilus, Plato, and Aristotle uh, inquire into this, and finally reconciled to that it exists in the brain, in the gut, and in the heart. And recently a lot of the literature and the scientific discoveries are pointing to where these receptor sites are located uh, that do the majority of the neurotransmitters and whatnot. Uh, and the, you know, the location uh, is in fact in the heart, in the gut, and in the brain. Uh, my particular interest in this area and the work that I uh, 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 focus on is that I assume, I start with the assumption that the human brain was at a level of perfection uh, that surpassed what we have today. And that through time, through protein misfolding, through dialectic misfolding, through 
evolution, whatever other things that we may attribute, had um, degenerated. Uh, we became essentially less intelligent than where we were. Uh, our faculties are lower in capacity than it was. And from this assumption, I asked myself, um, what can I do to compensate and bring back what is missing? And that led me to the concept of uh, brain prosthetics. Not just brain prosthetics in the sense that uh, it only solves for the diseased or the broken brain, but is also brain augmentation that naturally brings back the capacity and the things that were lost through time. Yeah. So. Now, would then the natural course of the evolution of the nervous system over time be then the natural course is the degeneration then of it towards the end of its life cycle. Life cycle. Okay. Essentially and what we see in uh, our normal uh, uh, living, uh, in our normal existence is that the person as the age, uh, their faculty moves toward degeneration. Uh, uh, obviously, the, the, the extreme case is the neurodegenerative uh, diseases or disorders, and the uh, uh, lower level is just the cognitive decline that uh, comes with age and whatnot. But um, in nature, it's compensated by a level of plasticity that, uh, that actually corrects for some of that, but not to the level where uh, faculty is augmented and uh, to the extent that we would like it to see. So, uh, in the offering that uh, my team and I have been working on, we were able to actually come up with these type of devices um, that we hope to be the next generation uh, prosthetic and brain augmentation devices. Okay, so we have methodologies to return the n nervous system more towards youthful homeostatic capacity without uh, prosthetics. These generalities, things of eating healthy, sleeping enough, exercising, these things can get us longer longevity and more healthier cognitive capacities during each day, these types of things, and over the lifetime. Yet, even then, we still get old with age and have degeneration at the end and so to be able to make then so then the, the next step is then we need to make the prosthetics right we need to preserve life preserve that that mind's creative capacity to continue engaging with its family and its community and its in the right. world and right. building more and creating more as it gets a ages more and it gets wiser potentially and right. is able to contribute better okay Okay. Right. It is, it is essentially like metaphorically assume that the aged human is like a, a collection of books mm. in a library. Mm. And in the case of Alzheimer, that library is getting burned, torched down with all the content and experience and the knowledge. Would we want to actually just sit and watch that happen and do nothing about it. In the state of, uh, an investigative state uh, of science today was relation, in relation to that disorder, for example, uh, some companies had given up on trying to find remedies or cure. Uh, some companies uh, just settled for lower level uh, way to compensate for the decline of uh, cognition or cognitive decline until such time that there's no longer these remedies work. That's inadequate. Um, there have got to be better solutions, there have got to be better compensators uh, and uh, that's where we actually focused and moving in that direction. What a profound analogy that 
the library is being burned these pages are being torn out you can't find what's written on the pages as easily all these types of things the associative web is is becoming worse and worse is degrading yeah. interesting yeah and how important is it to our especially our closest ones our loved ones and our families and our friends and our relationships that we want to preserve those books of life experience of wisdom of creative capacity throughout life and and be able to you know parse them and identify what were those key aspects of people's lives and that's that's such a profound importance of 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 this endeavoring now okay so now have then the last how long have you been then working on putting together these prosthetics and yeah teach us about that the sure. teams so i um i started my uh scientific journey focusing on uh essentially human agency and uh, a sense of self and looking at uh, the modeling of human intention uh, more in a computational sense. And then uh, I spent the majority of my early life and career uh, working as a government officer uh, in the intelligence community uh, and uh, subsequently at some point in time uh, I have an awakening uh, to uh, what I can do outside of that uh, space and I decided to look at where these um, apparatus are being fabricated, where it's being produced, uh, essentially in the seat of consciousness, which is the brain. Uh, so that journey would date back to uh, early 2000, uh, late 90s, uh, all the way to when I finished my study in Oxford in uh, the 2014. Uh, incorporating part of the study into looking at these prosthetics uh, from various aspects from the material science to the application uh, layer to the analytics uh, to the hardware design and so forth uh, so collectively it's an ongoing journey of about 20 years worth of work uh, that led to uh, a substantial amount of uh, design material uh, actual prototypes, uh, certain aspects of uh, application uh, on life patients of the therapeutic, uh, of the actual therapies itself. Uh, the lab in Oxford is uh, attributed to a large number of uh, 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 clinical interventions in Parkinson and in other uh, disorders. Uh, you can see in excess of 900 uh, patients have benefited from some of the therapeutics uh, effect. Uh, uh, intervention, interventions. Uh, the actual technology in the form factor that we would like it to be uh, is still an ongoing uh, work in progress that is likely to be uh, available on the market within the next two months or so. 20 years, yes. two, two decades in the, in the space, just sponging up the, the edge of the fields and wanting and synthesizing, figuring out your role in the equation and in also wanting to to go out and and make make impact at the level of what can be seen with our with our families with these closest ones to us when we see that someone has parkinson's was one of the neurodegenerative diseases that you listed and that what therapeutic benefits can we create that can almost immediately be seen to make us live healthier and right. wanting to get that done as quickly and efficiently as possible yeah <laughs> again it just brings me to what you were saying at the beginning that if we can have our these these libraries that we have within us if we can have additional books get stored and synthesized with yep. what's in the existing library who knows what unique new creative novel thoughts could come if we can more sustainably keep ourselves longer. Now, let's talk about this technology. So this is the most recent endeavoring. It's been 900, over 900 now patients. And the, the th it's for the therapy for Parkinson's. For uh, deep brain stimulations on Parkinson's, yes. Deep brain stimulation on Parkinson's. 
Okay, so right now we do both non-invasive brain stimulation and we do invasive yes. brain stimulation. So yeah, so let's, let's talk about those two sure. um, and then let's talk about how you are doing this invasively, how you're identifying the target, how you're implanting your technology and what it's doing. Yeah. Sure. So the, the, the world of uh, uh, brain machine interfaces, brain computer interfaces, uh, and uh, uh, DBS, which is deep brain stimulation, um, it fits into two categories, the, the invasive and the non-invasive. Uh, the invasive uh, basically uses tools and methodologies in surgery, functional neurosurgery, like craniotomy and craniofacial uh, insertion, which requires the opening of the brain and um, getting into layers of the cortex uh, that are relatively intrusive. The uh, non-invasive uh, class, which is like TDCS, TMS, and so forth, transmagnetic stimulation, direct current stimulation, um, these are passive, they don't penetrate the cortex to the level that we hope for, therefore you can't get the therapeutic effect for all the different things or indications that you hope for. Our technology at the moment fits within the class of the intrusive or semi-intrusive uh, intervention uh, with the direction towards non-intrusive uh, uh, technology, we refer to it as patching and whatnot. Um, the, this one is on the horizon. The current one that um, is ready to be deployed, uh, it's a system that we refer to as the NOAA system, which is made out of uh, a Kiwi chip and two fundamental layers of architecture. One is referred to as FCU, fundamental code unit, and one referred to as the VC, uh, which is the brain code. The fundamental code unit is uh, an analytical uh, framework uh, that essentially uh, leads us to understand the, 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 the inquiries between neurons and the communication, inner, uh, inner communication, inner exchange of communication between neurons, uh, thereby allowing us to uh, do the clinical intervention at the computational element. It's what being conveyed uh, rather than uh, you know the general flush of the intervention for the electrophysiology or the uh, electro activity of the brain or the chemical activities of the brain which is also some of what exists as a state of the art today. Uh, it also allows us to intervene uh, not only in an electrical fashion but also using the power of light uh, or optogenetics. Uh, the techniques of optogenetics is that we marry a protein segment uh, to the specific uh, neuron, uh, thereby activating uh, what we would refer to as neuropsin sites and causing this neuron to be photoreceptive. Uh, and when it becomes photoreceptive, then you're able to channel it into an on or off state. Uh, and uh, by changing this functional uh, structure, we're able to halt the disease uh, or modify essentially the programming of that particular zone. So I hope the technical level uh, is adequate for the audience, <laughs> uh, but the way I explain it is uh, more like uh, 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 putting the capacity of your house to receive electrical signal, uh, electrical of the grid or light of the sun. Uh, and then, then in the house, a lot of things can happen as a result of these capabilities. Uh, the, the structure of the world uh, when it comes to the neuronal uh, world essentially is that you have uh, a, a structure, a brain, you know, the actual neuronal structure uh, and the neuronal function and together it exhibits a behavior in the outside world. Uh, we want to modify this behavior in the outside world by affecting the function uh, layer, the functional layer and uh, since really the structural layer is uh, something that we don't want to manipulate that much uh, as that's the old method. Okay, so we are doing fMRI or EEG first to find this area of the brain that we need to target. Yes. Okay. Yes, so when you, when uh, the first level of intervention is to uh, reach um, a level of diagnosis and uh, perhaps before the clinical diagnosis is reached. So 
in the case of Parkinson, you can discover it as early as 20 some, you know, 21 years. Um, and uh, in the earlier you discover these disorders, uh, the more likely you are able to do something that can correct or slow down the disease. It's always interesting thinking about how we haven't had the full connectome yet of the brain fully mapped out in all of its nuanced neural architecture as well as neurotransmission that occurs and yet we are going in there and that in itself is like hmm well how do we you know get that done the connectome done in the full understanding of neurotransmission and then so then you you're i okay so you you're identifying the area that needs the therapeutic and then you have what is the what is the style of process to what are what are we sure yes what are we putting in and yeah, and how are we doing it? How we doing? So, the um, once the it is discovered that this person is, for example, received the clinical diagnosis of Parkinson, uh, and that the actual procedure is appropriate for them, uh, meaning that they're of a good, you know, they they're of good health otherwise that can handle a surgery, uh, like uh, craniotomy or uh, craniofacial. Uh, uh, with the Kiwi technology, you're able to intervene at craniofacial intervention uh, or surgical technique, the, the, the surgical technique that you can use um, because it's a small in size uh, and you essentially use this uh, uh, passageway to insert uh, a device about 1.9 by 2.2 millimeter in size, which is roughly about the grain of uh, rice. Uh, into the uh, zone that uh, is being implicated uh, in the case of Parkinson that would be the subthalamic nucleus or STN uh, in the basal ganglia and you drive the uh, Kiwi device chip uh, into that area. Uh, it is then uh, uh, made of material called carbon nanotubes uh, that are, uh, neurons start basically gathering around their area and growing uh, it would then sense um, this growth of neurons or the presence of these neurons, start modulating uh, electrophysiologically uh, a modulation pattern uh, that is fit uh, to uh, stop uh, the trimmer, which is the most immediate thing that we want to uh, stop. Uh, so this neuromodulation happens by pulse generation essentially at a very, very low uh, power. There two other therapeutic uh, uh, effects or engagement that takes place. One we refer to as a scaffolding effect and the second is, uh, or the third it would be the uh, optogenetics in the event that that's what we want to do which is regrowing cells uh, or reprogramming the functional area in this projection zone. Uh, the system has the capability of communicating this data uh, outside of the brain to a nearby device we refer to as a propagator and then the propagator is able to convey or connect this information to a system on the cloud um, that is essentially a, a, a full scale referred to as a brain operating system that is capable of processing this data, uh, generating additional inferences or corrections or modification to the firmware or to the software and then following the same path uh, for, uh, backward again uh, to uh, back into the chip uh, that process uh, continues on for the life of the uh, uh, therapy. Uh, we do inductively charging so that it's a chronic device. We do not have to go back and take out uh, unless there's some serious uh, uh, clinical malfunction or malfunction, electronic malfunction of the device, uh, which is all to be determined and worked out in the future tests uh, before we actually go into the first uh, uh, patient with this full encapsulation. All Parkinson's is basal ganglia issue in that area? Parkinson is a, is a complex uh, disorder, uh, but it maps to essentially the uh, dopamine uh, secretion and the vesicles that secretes dopamine uh, is not working optimally. Uh, and there's uh, additional explanation to the causality of what causes that to happen in the first place, first order effect and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, and we're essentially treating it when it, became, when it becomes absolutely 
instead of uh, 21 uh, years yeah. Yeah. ahead of time. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, then the the neural prosthetic size of a grain of rice. Then, what? How, how was that fabricated at that small of a size to be able to connect to neurons inside of? And how does it connect to neurons? How does it do the optogenetics for the therapeutic effect? Sure. The system is made of a system on a chip. Uh, a system on a chip is connected to the uh, CNT chip. Uh, the CNT chip and the system on a chip is, is get a radio element and a battery element. Uh, and all together actually is fabricated of material that is unique and to shrink it to that size of a package has been quite an engineering challenge yeah. that we still uh, working aspects of it. Um, but our target size is approximately 1.9 by 2.2 millimeter. My goodness, yeah, I'm just imagining the smallest, tiniest little tweezer hands. So just That was working that to, surgery. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's working that surgery, yeah. That's trying to put together all these complex pieces Wow, yeah, and then you explain the the inductive charging and then the com so there's there's also com there's communication then that happens it's able to then touch is this tens of thousands of neurons or how many we, we're yeah. targeting uh, or our goal is a million um, we are targeting uh, in this next one approximately 10,000 uh, we are now at about a uh, few thousands um, and it has a level of sophistication of reconfiguring some of these channels and um, um, sensing what it's touching um, um, unprecedentedly beyond any capabilities that has been expressed um, so far. Sensing what it's touching. I was thinking about that as upon entry I was envisioning this forest. Yeah, a f yeah. and then it's okay Let's say you put like a, a in an actual forest, you put a bigger grain of rice into a forest, yeah, and then it just touches all of the leaves, right? And then the idea well, it doesn't quite know what it's touching at, at entry. Yeah, this. So then I was imagining that there is some sort of a like upon entry that there is some sort of a this like linking process of oh I know what I'm touching, uh, yeah. how to stimulate it, uh, how to do the therapeutic effects, and that's. Like, how does that The happen? system carries onboard intelligence um, in, in software. That's a NOAA system, we, which it stands for Neurons on Augmented Human. And essentially is made out of these various modules um, that is onboard. And these modules sense and um, position these neurons in space and figure out, you know, whether it's touching mm. uh, the tail or the front or the middle or so forth and then um, assign the, you know, what is the modulation uh, pattern that is going to be uh, uh, reinduced into, the, into this projection zone. So these sensors are at like the scale of like a... Micron. A micron. Yeah. So, so at the micron level, it's like little micron ha like hairs or like yeah, tiny vesicle. little vesicles. Yeah. And that's able to decipher what part of the neuron it's yeah. So she, yeah. And wow. And hopefully ten thousand on this next one. Yeah. Be as we as we're clearing out the uh, or debugging the uh, first scale, then we we keep increasing uh, the order of complexity. Um, yes. But the target is about a million, and um, the actual device is engineered such that you can actually put in the brain uh, an number of greater let's say greater than 10 devices can actually be inserted into one human brain uh, without causing uh, uh, any damage so, so then there's a process of processing the signals that you're getting yes. and then then there's a also a process of that tiny little grain of rice being able to communicate what it's reading yeah to through a location Close that loop. Yeah. Close to but to the cl cloud. The cloud, yeah. F okay, for lots of computational power to understand, yeah. what, and then there's a closed loop. To, it distributes that back into the, the device for what to do. Yeah, and then then the device then will say, okay, so then that means that this area is my.
target this yeah. aspect and this is where I need to apply the optogenetics and then yeah but you said there was a process of you need to make the cells photoreceptive yes so yeah. there is a process where um, we basically introduce the adenovirus to um, allow that um, genetic therapy to actually take place there is a process to uh, identify the number of connects um, there is a process to choose the appropriate therapy uh, this uh, uh, basically going up the stack all the way to the cloud and back to the device again um, that's a process where the system is learning uh, and depositing some of the information is being collected uh, real-time and near real-time but most of the intervention is taking place uh, on the device directly real-time because it carries a system on a chip so it's capable of executing uh, certain courses of action that is already being prescripted if you will okay and the the this virus that's applied makes the neurons photoreceptive then then you apply the therapeutic effects of the optogenetics and then after a period of how long does the virus then leave roughly the six months six uh, months yeah. within less okay. than six months of sustainability and reinjections you can actually uh, uh, reach the therapeutic effect okay six months of of so six months of i'm, I'm i can i would would i feel do the do they no. feel they no, don't you, you feel don't, you ever don't, you don't feel any negative effect but you do you ever feel like optogenetic do i would i ever feel like my within my basal ganglia that this is happening so you feel the tremor effect is gone uh you'd feel positive effect interesting so that rather effect. than a tremor effect occurring i would i wouldn't feel i where there would be a tremor effect yeah. it would be it'd be voided out yeah but interesting and then with but within i'm just trying to imagine something in my basal ganglia making it so that I don't feel the tremor effect yeah. okay and what that would feel like well it, it, it's 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 like um, uh, a person on ADHD um, who is extremely hyper and all of a sudden they take their medication and they feel so relaxed and calm mm. it's almost it's almost like that mm. feeling okay, okay. Um, uh, or a person who is um, uh, you know, you, well, Parkinson. Parkinson has a very ugly side to it, where you all of a sudden become like a child again. You're not able to mm. uh, to plan your motion. You're not able to uh, control your cognitive capacity. Mm. Uh, other other faculties and other uh, uh, psychotic uh, 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 also behaviors. The, you you essentially benefit from seeing all these things gone and over time completely eliminated once the therapy is in effect and the regrowth takes place and the electrophysiology back to homeostasis they, you, 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 you're back to normal uh, you can focus um, you can focus on, on, on bigger things of being a human uh, right and if you uh, you know, wherever you, whatever you were at, at the elevation of knowledge, uh, you're able to climb back to that elevation and, and then be there and then climb further uh, rather than crash and burn, like I said in, the, in Alzheimer, um, uh, which is uh, inevitably the state that we're in today. Yeah, that's beautifully said. And then it's, it's important yeah. to point that when, when we do tag some of these neurons and um, address the corrections. Um, it's not that it's going to statically stay there forever. There is a process of corticogenesis that uh, uh, and um, uh, motion that happens where things actually change. Um, but when you change, there is a corrected um, next generation that came into that place, which is important to see um, uh, happening in the zone of projection that was once ill and now it's cured. And has new neurons grown? Well essentially, we'll essentially have new neurons. Um, uh, if the intervention happens at a, at a time when there's completely a death of neurons, then um, you won't have that. Uh, if the intervention comes earlier, then the stem cells and the oh, ability to regrow would take place. Oh, see, this is decision. why identifying this with that 
like you said, 21 years in advance yeah, yeah, yeah. while the stem cells are still able to then do the neurogenesis. That's yeah. okay, cool, cool. And we had to design um, uh, a tech form uh, for the measurement of activities during the living um, that actually a wearable. Uh, it's an essential earbud that allows us to actually do this detection and help aid the physician to do the, the diagnosis as early as possible mm. because it will do the measurement during the time that you're making coffee or you or you uh, having breakfast or you you know uh, or, or, or your normal day of work so that you're capable of actually recognizing this this uh, uh, consequential uh, indicators and soon it's just computer vision occurring in the background yeah. and, and watching that yeah. movement yeah okay and the biometrics constantly being being streamed up yeah. and analyzed yeah. Yeah. yeah now what's what's next in the trajectory of this you have okay it's parkinson's it's it's de it's trying to democratize that more around yeah. the world to help people um and then also it's other neurodegenerative yeah, identifying other biomarkers for neurodegeneration and trying to go in there and make augmentations. Yeah. And then is there also a map, a roadmap for neuro augmentation at large for even someone sure. that may be a, you know, a 15 or 25 year old or, and then you were also teaching me this and yesterday about potentially just being able to have this as a patch instead of an invasive. So yeah, yeah take us down this road. So you, 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 you kind of like to, to go down that path, you'd have to imagine um, a different world. Uh, today we depend on the iPhone, on PDAs, computers, all of these devices as an aid for computation um, and as a way to learn language, as a way to uh, facilitate uh, new uh, uh, information and whatnot. Well, let's imagine a world where this type of interventions um, or this type of uh, needs uh, are not needed. You, you, you think of a question and the question is uh, queried or searched or um, uh, done uh, and offloaded directly into your uh, visual cortex and then it's all happening within your brain. So your eyes is doing the search, your thoughts is being a query, your text query essentially, and then your brain is uh, projecting that information. And it's all happening uh, that would enable you to do photo reading, that would enable you to download new language, uh, have an application that does whatever you want it to do. Um, well, the path to that is essentially understanding the details that's in the uh, brain, the pathways, and being able to capture uh, and learn these pathways so that we can actually have a patch device that hacks its way back, at the risk of using the word hacking, um, and using the entire nervous system collectively as a whole. This future that you're imagining of us being able to download a, a little SDK of a language or a the cutting edge of mathematics or it's such an interesting world wouldn't I want all of it and then just have it all in store to access at any point make all these associations in the web yes and then when we all have access to that, then, then that's the civilization's knowledge, fully democratized, accessible with thought. Absolutely. And that's this flow of, instead of meat sticks. Yes. Yeah. The limitation, the limitation is essentially um, imposed by how fast you're typing by, um, you know, think of the moving from the wire speed to your thought speed. Um, would I be as greedy as saying, I want to download 50 languages to my head, 100 languages? 
the entire set of languages as known to humankind. Um, yes, I would. And it is, it sits at a fundamental belief of those who want to actually make the machine have this capability versus those who want the brain to have this capability. I believe the computing power needed, it sits in that box that we all carry, the brain, with all its affiliation, the gut and the heart and so forth, is being able to actually tap into these hidden resources and into this computing power and into these gates and into this uh, uh, peripheral system and, and have it work the way it was intended to at some point in evolution. That's the key differentiator between uh, my school of thought and that of some of others that uh, are actually approaching the brain-machine interface uh, 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 problem. So it may be that these, this ultimate evolutionary trajectory of our species on this rock, the next step is to treat the brain, the gut, the heart as gates of opening that portal up so that we can have this free flow of civilization's knowledge of yes. back and forth through from us and through it rather than the appendages and yes. using these up externally inside of us. Yes. So, the, so the speed of creativity and all that stuff, it's just communication, all that stuff. It just, it just becomes, it, 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 it seems frightening to some, but it is what is beyond GXXXX. Is it in a transmission speed, if you will? Uh, do we even need these wires? Do we even need this uh, ether connection? It might be something even faster than that. And uh, we won't know until we actually explore these areas. And I expect that we will see this uh, eventuality within 10 to 50 years. So it's not a significant period of time further out. And to do it with a great amount of ethics yes. and morality and philosophy embedded with all of these brilliant neuroengineers and neurodesigners, neuroaugmenters, can we get these right philosophers and ethicists and moral scientists working alongside them and especially geopolitically, yeah. can we make it for peace um, and for creativity, yes. for collaboration? But also we, you know, compete to get there, but in a way that is collaborative and yes, yeah, that's such a critical component of it. Yeah, going to our first question is, do I take this capability and make it available and only available to augment soldiers, or do I democratize it that make it available to everybody, starting with uh, those who are inflicted with the worst conditions like? Uh, neurodegenerative disorders and whatnot, preserving our libraries, preserving our heritage, restoring human dignity. That's what uh, brings it back to your initial question, is the importance of um, this reallocation of resources. The doesn't start from the budget table, from the capital investment. It starts from our own conscience drive intention to guide it in a particular direction. Uh, today there's a lot of work in that area and support in that area that comes from uh, military organizations, DARPA, uh, NESD, etc. various programs like that um, with others are following it in that uh, direction. Uh, sometime you know sadly uh, without questioning the ethical uh, and the moral implication. I do believe that within my group we start first with the ethical and moral implication and we've been designing toward human dignity rather than design just to do it for the sake of technology. Excellent, yes. That ethos is so strong in you and then that resonates with others that are able to also realize that and carry that forth as the first principle. Yeah. yeah. 
couple quick ones on the way out, Newton. Um, you mentioned that consciousness being the seat within the the evolution of the heart, gut, brain that that sentience arise through that process. There's also so many other spiritual leaders that say that 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 we come from the source and that we take our seat of consciousness intentionally in these bodies to experience specific lessons on this school of earth. What are your thoughts about that? I think that we we are all correct in the way we describing it. It's the description is coming from the journey of where we're coming from. So each one perceives it in a slightly different narrative. But the collective narrative is the agreement that there exists a conscience. And uh, whether we want it to be a conscience that it's uh, uh, pure and reasonable and fitted toward being able to accept uh, the larger uh, things that, uh, you know, uh, sits uh, ahead of us. Um, is it journey into the stars? Is it journey into consciousness itself? Um, it, all was, it all starts with trying to understand what is consciousness? What is intelligence? Where is the seat of this all? And it brings it back again to a question that has been asked uh, thousands of years ago. And we still don't have a definitive answer. Do we need a definitive answer? Or is the journey itself, the questions along the way, are the important part? Mm. Power in that question along the way in the journey. And Newton, how about, um, are we in a simulation? We could be. We could be. Um, yeah. I, 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 I couldn't give narratives on the top of that. And what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Existence. You know, um, to be appreciative of the beauty of existence rather than uh, resent it and worry about the heaviness of it and all the things that brings plagues and psychosis. Just be happy you exist fact that there is something yes. instead of nothing yeah. yes wow Newton, thank you so much for coming on the show thanks. teaching thanks. us about the future of the brain thanks man <laughs> it's such a pleasure we're super appreciative and grateful thank you thank you thank you thanks everyone for tuning in we greatly appreciate it we'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode let us know what you're thinking also check out the links in the bio again newtonhoward.com ni2o.com as well as Newton's LinkedIn profile. Check those out and have more conversations with your friends, your families, coworkers, people online on social media about the future of the brain and about all the technologies we talked about in preserving these libraries and endeavoring more creatively. And also support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the spiritual leaders, the organizations around the world that you believe in support Newton, support simulation. Our links are below too to our Patreon, our cryptocurrency, our PayPal link, design cool merch and get paid. Join us and help us grow. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Thank you very much for tuning in and we will see you soon. Peace. <laughs> this is good. Good job, brother. Good job. <laughs> <laughs>